representative republic, but that's still not good enough. It does not do justice to America. What's the difference? Between, I said a lynch mob is a democracy. Uh, three, three wolves and a sheep deciding what they're having for lunch is a democracy also. But it's a, and it can be, you know, this represented democracy just adds a representation level on the, on the thing. How about a constitutional republic? There you go. Okay, well, a constitutional republic is pretty good. You ought to try it. But, and, and I, and I don't have any problem, you know, with, but I, running through this exercise to get us to think through this thing, even a constitutional republic, we can end up doing some bad, wrong things and so on. In America, the thing that, what did I say at the very beginning, that defines America, that makes us different than all the other countries, is God-given unalienable rights. If I were coming up with what I would call a, a perfect one, I'd say a constitutional republic with God-given unalienable rights. That's long, I know. Given inalienable. What's the difference? There's no difference. One's a little more poetic. I like to say unalienable. I can't spell inalienable. Pardon? I can't spell inalienable. So can you can't read what I'm writing. A constitutional public with God given with God given unalienable rights. In America, one sheep and his unalienable rights trumps all of the wolves. It trumps all of our presidents and congressmen and everything else because our God-given unalienable rights shall not be infringed or violated or, or, uh, or taken away by, by our government. That's what we'll be spending so much time looking about and, uh, and understanding. It's going to be tough. You know, we're, we're, going to do, we're going to try to do this in eight 60-minute sessions. And uh, we're just not going to cram it all in, but we're going to do the very best that we can. If you will, you know, kind of look at your glossaries, think about it when we're going through. If you'll take time and read the, uh, uh, the 5,000 year leap, then you'll understand many of these principles probably better than because you'll get more in-depth time and thought about them as you read. And uh, Cleon Skousen, there's no one more readable and understandable in, in my book than Cleon Skousen. Uh, so this is where I came so the founders said, we don't want 100% government. We don't want 0% government. And they chose the balanced middle. The balanced middle. They said, we got to have some government. It's a necessary evil. You can do all the quotes from them. But it's a necessary evil for the US Constitution. OK, just for exercise here, real quick, because we don't have time. You can't be. Shrinking violence, I guess is the, the term that I'm looking for. Please just, just uh, shout it out. Uh, where does an e fit on this? Where does what? The what? Probably. e -mir. What about Sultan? Same thing. Sultan. What about the Chinese? The guys who head up the dynasty. What's their name? Emperors. 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 Most of the names that we would come up with for political leaders is, what about a president? Well, there are presidents <coughs> in Russia right now, and Russia is returning to a, but we have a president here in the United States. A president doesn't really, doesn't really tell you where it is. It depends on their particular uh, government. And uh, someone here said a constitutional republic. Uh, England has a constitutional republic. Now we're gonna we're gonna trash the English while we're in our revolutionary yeah, time. We're gonna talk about all the bad things that they did. But the truth is that England is our ancestors, back through all through you know back to William the Conqueror and before that the Anglo-Saxons probably uh, even more so maybe than the Normans from France and so on. Aren't they a monarchy also? Pardon? Is that England also a monarchy? Yeah, an emperor is a type of of a monarchy passed down through the. the the, the truth is, that we would we could come up with this long list. We'd probably come up with a hundred of them, and I don't know for sure, but my guess is that probably over 90% of the people that have lived under this earth have lived under some kind of a of a dictatorship, a tyrannical thing. Whether they had good or bad kings is another thing. I think the question was about a monarchy in England. They have no power. They're more of a figurehead today. Yes. Yeah, yeah, they are a figurehead, and when we 
maybe when we get around to talk about. But yes, the Queen is a is, is a big figurehead. She doesn't have any political powers. They have a prime, they have a parliament like our Congress, and they have a uh, House of Lords and the House of Commons, which is roughly uh, analogous to. And then they have a, a prime minister who is roughly the equivalent of our president here. But our president is not only the chief executive, but he's the chief of state. And so when a high person comes from some other country, really, really, really high, it gets uh, greeted by Obama. If it's not, then it, if it's not really high, maybe it gets uh, by, or, by Biden or, or uh, Secretary of State Kerry. Or, who's our Secretary of State? So I said Clinton, she's gone. Kerry. So, but in England, when if, if the president of the United States goes over there, it's the queen who brings the queen is the is the chief of state there, but not the, not doesn't have political power as you said. That's Susan Rice. Pardon? Susan Rice. Second Su Susan Susan Rice. Black lady. I have to admit I'm a uh, black lady who was used to be something else. Susan Rice, Condoleezza Rice. Yeah, they all can. John Kerry, Hillary Clinton, they're all. <laughs> Whether that's good or bad. I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, my, my, the purpose of this thing here is to talk about uh, a correct political spectrum. And you know, and by the way, where are the Republicans on this? Where are the Democrats on this? Okay, so we got the Republicans here. Where? Uh, Pretty the close. Republicans, Democrats. Where's Fox News? Where's ABC, NBC, CBS? They're a little NBC, bit NBC, left NBC. of center. I'm going to say Fox is right here because they always support the Republicans and the ABC, NBC, CBS. And CNN, yes, they're all uh, different. But and if we were to talk about every leader you can think of, where's Pol Pot on here? <laughs> He's over here. Uh, where's any leader? Where's Ronald Reagan on here? Dead. He's probably closer over here. Uh, where's Obama? He's probably closer over here. More so you than think? His party. Where is uh, uh, FDR? He's probably over here somewhere. Anybody you come up with, do you notice there's nobody over here? There's everything, all the political action, everything that's happening in the, in the political world on a correct political spectrum is happening between the balanced middle, between the U.S. Constitution and, uh, and tyranny, 100% government. It's only a matter of how much of that that we're going to have. We'll come back to that uh, on and off. Limited government. I don't know why I put that on there. We have limited government. The, the, the divine right of kings. What's the divine right of kings? What was the idea behind the divine right of kings? That they received their power from God. Yeah, that they, they had a divine right, that they received their power from God. Uh, are kings a bad thing? I've already said, no, they're not always a bad thing. In the Old Testament, I'm not going to make this a religion class, but... That's history, too. In the Old Testament, the Israelites wanted a king. Give us a king. You know, they said to Samuel, I think, the prophet, and Samuel said, surely this thing leadeth to bondage, you know. And, but they said, all the other nations have a king. We want a king. They had a pretty good system. They had a system of judges that was pretty much implementing people's law. But they wanted a king like all the other uh, countries had. And so Samuel went to the Lord and found the Lord said, okay. And he tells them, uh, anoint Saul, and then anoint David, and eventually Solomon. And, uh, and even ones that started off as good kings, like Saul, and like uh, David, and like Solomon, ended up uh, being corrupted, you know, being corrupted. I did one time a study myself where in the Old Testament of, of the kingdom of Judah, and then the, ten, the kingdom of Israel, and I counted, you know, 30 or 40 kings that I could find in there, and then I tried to determine said, which ones were good and bad kings, it seemed like one of them had about 60, 40 bad kings, and the other ones had about 70, 30 uh, bad, bad kings versus good kings. It's just a lot of power to give one person. It's not necessarily bad to have a, a king, but the divine right of kings was, and I'm not, I'm not sure how much to take this, so I'll just kind of say it real fast. Uh, after Christ and the apostles were gone, there were a lot of people especially in the Western world, Europe and so on, that believed in Christianity. It was a powerful, powerful force. If there's anything that I've learned after the last over 40 years in politics is that politicians cannot leave alone. They can't leave alone some powerful uh, thing that's got 
the attention and the loyalty of a lot of people. They couldn't leave Christianity alone. So they politicized uh, Christianity and, you know, back about 350 AD. But, and so we had, we had for hundreds of years, over a thousand years, we had most of the, ki the kings and queens in uh, uh, Europe were, uh, until England formed its own uh, church, uh, they, were, they were anointed by the Pope. And you had a, a close relationship between the, the Roman, the Holy Roman Church and, and uh, kings and so on. Eventually, King, what's his name, Henry VIII, wanted to marry Anne Boleyn, right? And, and, uh, and the church wouldn't allow him to do that, so he started his own church, you know. And, and, uh, but still, you had the same deal. You had a close relationship between uh, church and state, and the idea with the divine right of kings was that it gave the king a lot of power, that God, through his representative here on earth, had anointed him and given him power, as had happened uh, in the Old Testament. So, so by the time we come up to 1776, the beginnings of America, uh, most of the Western world was operating on the idea of the divine right of kings. And does anyone know what time is it? 7.32. Okay. Let's see how fast uh, we can do this. Talk about types of government. I'm going to set aside that divine right of kings for just a minute. Talk about economics. Adam Smith and the wealth of nations. Can you put up the economics uh, thing on this? Our founding fathers, well, I'm going to talk about economics. Economics is a, a major uh, deal, and our founding fathers chose an economic system. What was the natural economic system that we chose? Capitalism. Capitalism uh, versus communism or fascism. Real quickly, uh, it's just a chart. Very simple. Uh, uh, economic system, the difference between capitalism, in capitalism there's two questions. Who owns the means of production? The factories, the, the mountains, the gold, the iron ore, and, and so on, who, the timber. Who owns the means of production and who controls the means of production? In capitalism, you have private ownership. The people own and the people control the means of production. Uh, socialism and communism are the same thing as far as an economic system. Co communism is just socialism, it's in their name, uh, but it's just socialism with a militaristic aspect to it. But economically, they are 100% the same. So socialism or communism, as far as an economic system is concerned, is government ownership <coughs> of the means of production and government control of the means of production. Fascism is what we call the third way. It's private ownership but government control of the means of production. In other words, Mr. Hitler said, said to Mr. Schindler or to Mr. Siemens, you know, Siemens elevators and, and uh, escalators, and said, said, you can keep your elevator factories or whatever he had as long as you build, do what I say. And he said to Mr. Porsche, you can keep your car factories as long as you build my tanks and so on. And I want a people's car, by the way, Volkswagen. So Ferdinand Porsche did the uh, Volkswagen. He said to, to uh, Mr. Schindler, you can keep your pots and pans factory as long as you do what I say. And uh, he wanted him to build munitions. And we know the story of uh, Schindler and how he tried to make sure most of his armaments did not work. And then he used the money that he made to save thousands of people, over 2,000 people. So those are the three basic, uh, capitalism, socialism, and, uh, and fascism. There's really no difference between socialism and communism and fascism is because it's both of them are government control. It doesn't really matter a whole lot who owns the means of production if Hitler's telling them exactly what to do. And so on this correct political spectrum over here, it's wrong to say that Hitler is, I wrote to a guy one time who's, for whom I have great respect, and I won't mention because some of you would know him and so on, and he'd given a talk, and I said, why do you perpetuate that false political spectrum? I know you know better, and I said, on the one you're talking about, on the far right, I mean, you got me over on the right, and on the far right, you got Hitler. That puts me over near Hitler. I'm, I'm uncomfortable being near Hitler. There's no difference between Hitler and Stalin. Stalin, Hitler, Pol Pot, wow. Mao Zedong, Idi Amin, any kind of tyrants 
are the same thing on a correct political spectrum. They're almost, if not 100% government uh, control. It's tyranny. And I don't want to be over near those things. So on a correct political spectrum, all those bad guys are over there uh, uh, with too much government. So these are the economic systems. It was not a coincidence that in 1776, Adam Smith uh, wrote The Wealth of Nations. I don't know how many of you have read The Wealth of Nations, but uh, I, I got an undergraduate degree in economics, and I read these books, and we had Samuelson and Friedman and uh, Keynesian economics, and we also read uh, Marx and the other stuff, but of course we didn't believe Marx. But the, and I was out of school for years before it occurred to me, they lied to me. All of that stuff was not based on the scientific method. The scientific method, the scientific method is you gather a whole bunch of data. You don't start off with a theory. You gather all this data, and, uh, and then you look for some kind of a trend. And whatever that trend is, we, we call that a hypothesis, and we test the hypothesis. And if it works, then you got a working theory. But the idea is you don't start off with something in mind. Well, these books that I read, uh, Marx, we, we know, of course, was hired and paid to write the Communist Manifesto and to come up with his uh, economic system. We know that John Maynard Keynes was hired to, to design a system that would, whereby government, you could control uh, people by fiscal uh, government taxation, you know, policy. And so, And yet, in these books, we had these beautiful charts. And then we had all this data, but it was made up data. Adam, well, Adam Smith did not do that. He used the economic data that we had, the economic history of the world. And that's what he used in, in The Wealth of Nations. And he came up, that's where he came up with his hypotheses, you know, the invisible hand. And that the thing that brings about the greatest amount of goods and prosperity and freedom for the greatest number of people is a whole bunch of selfish people out there doing their own thing, trying to produce for themselves. I have a, uh, one of my sons, I have two sons that went on a mission for our church over to Russia. And uh, one of them went back a year and a half later, married or dated this one girl and married her and, and uh, they couldn't, he couldn't get her over here. So we had to go over there for her to get to, uh, uh, so he could marry her and, and get a spouse lease and get her back over here. So this was 20 years ago, after the Iron Curtain had fallen. And one of the things we got to do, we're out in the country. Nobody, they don't have private property over there. Private property there is a 50-year lease from the government, sometimes a 99-year lease. And so, uh, but everybody, and everybody, you know, so all that wonderful land over nine time zones in Russia is owned by the government, except people are allowed to have a little dacha or daca, um, a summer cottage, you know, and they are allowed to, to grow their own little uh, gardens out there and keep the produce that's on it. And the amazing thing that is, at least as of that time, I, I haven't seen the statistics now, but as of that time, but as of that time, uh, there was more produce produced on these private little plots than there was in all these huge government combines that they had spread out all over Russia. Why do you think that would be? Self-interest. Self-interest. They got to keep their own, they got to keep the fruit of their labors and they, they worked harder at that and so on. And, and uh, that's what uh, Adam Smith said with the Wealth of Nations. It, capitalism naturally became, now we talk about capitalism today and crony capitalism and evil. You know, there's all kinds of uh, ways that you can do bad with a, with a good thing. But capitalism itself is just free enterprise. It's laissez-faire, as they say in France. Leave us alone. The government, leave us alone. It's just free enterprise, capitalism. That's our economic system here in America. OK, I'm sorry, I got to pick it up here. The Protestant Reformation. We're talking about now things that lead up to the, today, the preludes to our Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. We'll declare our independence next week. But today, we're just talking about the preludes. One of the major, major preludes was the Protestant uh, Reformation. You had, uh, and I put a couple of examples here, Martin Luther, who was a German monk, who uh, was, was said, wait a minute, that's not what the Bible says. And he says that it ought to, and, and we ought to have the Bible translated into the people's tongue. So he translated the Bible into, into German. And uh, William Tyndall uh, translated the Bible into English. And they both got themselves, well, 
William Temple got himself burned at the stake for his trouble. Martin Luther, there was a, there was a, a war there, and so he didn't end up getting burned at the stake. Uh, the Puritans, you remember the Puritans? They were in England also. The Puritans wanted to purify the church. They wanted to get back, because now you've got the, the Bible translated and people can read it, and they wanted to purify it and get the, the church, whatever that is, uh, back according to true biblical principles. One of the things that the Puritans came up with, it's the most important, I say, to us, was, was the idea that you could pray directly to God. Now, you and I take that for granted, right? Uh, but that was not. Back then, you had to go through the pope or the priest, the king. Uh, the politicians were able to maintain power, but the Puritans had this heretical idea that we, we had the right to pray directly to God. That gave us a connection to God the powers that be didn't want us thinking along those lines. So they were persecuted. They were persecuted so badly, I mean, some were put to death and, and, and in other ways persecuted, that the pilgrims left England and they made a pilgrimage over to America. And they were the pilgrims, right? The uh, Puritans, but they were, they were a, a essential part of the Protestant uh, Reformation. All the churches in the world have wonderful, good things in them. But as far as America is concerned, and the and the uh, the development eventually of our constitutional republic with God-given unalienable rights, the Protestant Reformation was essential, as we'll see, towards this idea of God-given unalienable rights. Another thing was the scientific enlightenment. What does science have to do with it? I put Sir Isaac Newton. We could have put other people on there, but so I, Sir Isaac Newton, as you know, he was the man. I mean, he was his uh, economics, uh, physics mathematics, everything that Sir Isaac Newton did until Einstein came along, until the last century when you started having problems where you're, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, approaching the speed of light. When you start to approach the speed of light, then Newtonian physics starts to break down. And, and, and Einstein came up with some new now. We had Einstein and then and quantum physics and so on. But everything else to today, 90% of our physics is still Sir Isaac Newton. He really was uh, the man. But the thing that I wanted to say about uh, Sir Isaac Newton is that his, this idea, Sir Isaac Newton probably uh, better than anyone, uh, gave us the <laughs> idea that the laws that govern human de de behavior come from natural laws. He called them natural laws. Our founding fathers, and fathers called them the laws of nature or, and of nature's God. That the, that the, he said, not, we're not just talking about physics, he said the laws that govern human behavior, that's what I'm looking for here, are derived from the nature of human themselves, humans themselves, to be universally applied. And this laid the foundation for the ideas of these political philosophers that we're gonna talk about. We can talk about Hume and Montesquieu and Locke and Voltaire, and a Hobbes, but I can't remember what all of them said. Real quick, there's a black trailblazer out here with the lights on. Sorry. Uh, no. So, so let's do that real quickly. I'm going to talk about the uh, what I call the political philosophers, for want of a better word. Thomas Hobbes wrote the Leviathan. Going through these pretty quick. This isn't something you can probably make notes on, but I just want you to get the perspective. Thomas Hobbes. Uh, we associate him with the idea of a social contract, the idea that there's a social contract between we the people and government. And by the way, Thomas Hobbes liked the idea of the divine right of kings, but he believed that we had the right to make a social contract. He just said that we the people should voluntarily uh, uh, have a social contract and have a king with the king and give him certain powers that we the people should give him certain but he just thought it was a good effective you know so it works so well that you just don't have to go through congress or parliament you just the king just says it and we do it and, and i hope it's a good thing but so he liked that but his idea was a social contract john locke took it a step further and he he rejected the notion of the divine right of kings he said i don't believe in that but i do believe in the social contract and uh and he paved the way for more radical notions about the, the uh, rights of in individuals, saying that individuals possess certain unalienable rights. And this idea of an unalienable rights was being talked about 
uh, long before our founding fathers, <coughs> but for the last hundred years or so before our founding fathers, virtually everybody that was philosophizing about it was talking about the rights of man and the and unalienable rights of people. And because we are the sovereigns, because God has given us unalienable rights, that therefore government shouldn't be able to do anything without the consent of the sovereigns, without the consent of the government. Uh, could you put the one up there that has a... Uh, <coughs> rule along with God is sovereign. Yeah, the, the, what, let's go ahead and just go to the long one there. The, the legal long. documents limited by the, 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 the limited the king. So you got uh, Hobbes, John Locke said that when people enter a social contract, he said the government will protect their natural rights. We're going to talk a lot about these, and I'll just say it up front. I don't know any difference between natural rights and unalienable rights. <coughs> and civil liberties, the liberties of man. I'll come up with some other phrases here. Uh, and then Rousseau came after Locke, and Rousseau about the same time. He talked about popular sovereignty, popular meaning the people, the sovereignty. Remember the sovereign's the boss, the sovereignty of the people. And he said that, that his theory was that government is created by people and that it depends on the people for their authority to rule. They were overlapping and saying very similar things. And so some people might say, well, what's the big deal with the founding fathers? Everybody else was, was talking about it and so on. The big deal is nobody ever put it all together and no one ever wrote it and, and then designed a government that would protect these unalienable rights and it worked uh, successfully and so on. That's probably enough. Uh, Hobbes, Rousseau, and especially the timelines here. Let's go back to, uh, if we're talking about the things that led up to, the preludes to American uh, freedom and our freedoms and so on. No, the one that, the other one. Is the one that we, the one you just had up there. That, nope. That's the one I just had up there. The one that has uh, uh, things pre, uh, oh, yeah. predated. Yeah, I did this sort of as a, as a nod to uh, uh, Chris Ann Hall, for those of you who have listened to Chris Ann Hall, and she calls it her genealogy of the Constitution. And she, what she's talking about is five documents that go way, way back that, that kind of had some of the ideas that are in our Declaration. And in, the, and, uh, in, in 1100 AD, there was the Charter of Liberty. You remember you had 1066 was the Norman conquest of England. And uh, his son or grandson, Henry I of England wrote this Charter of Liberties. He was forced to do so by the people, uh, saying that there were certain laws, it wrote down certain laws that the king had to go by. It limited the king's power and, uh, regarding his nobles, church officials, and some individuals. It was the forerunner of the Magna Carta, but generally speaking, it was ignored. And he signed it with the throat, sort of the throat. And then the Magna Carta was 1215. This time it was King John. You remember Robin Hood and evil King John? Well, he was he preached on. Uh, he was evil, and he was forced by the barons too that got in there in Runnymede at the point of a long sword, as I believe it was. And he had to sign this this great charter of a, of a guarantee of rights to again to his barons and to the clergy. They weren't as worried about the little people at that point, but at least it was a limitation on the king. The Magna Carta, for the most part, was ignored by kings also. But then four or five hundred years later. Uh, it had a kind of resurgence in the 1600s with uh, political philosophers and so on, and parliament, they had a parliament by then, uh, talking about the rights of the people. And in 1628, you had the Petition of Right that set out specific liberties that the king is prohibited from infringing. Well, how could they do that? This is the divine right of kings. The idea of a divine right of kings is that the king can do anything that he darn well pleases regardless of the will of the people. But these things were going against that idea. In 1100, in 1215, Magna Carta, the Petition of Right, this set certain And then in 1641, the Grand Remonstrance, which was another list of grievances, this time passed by Parliament, or was passed by the House of Commons, and then it was presented to the King by, uh, by Parliament, and it included a bunch of different rights, and it had some real specific things there about no cruel and unusual punishment. 
and it talked about the rule of law. Gosh, are we going to read this and say, gosh, maybe we didn't come up with anything. So we came up with something really, really special because we put it all together. We, our founding fathers, put it all together. And then they established a, uh, a government that actually worked and continues to work until this day. Let's see, after this, the English Bill of Rights, going down a little bit further. I think that's, that's the it. last of the, that's we it. call it the English Bill of Rights, and a lot of people say that that's a predecessor to the United States Bill of Rights. It is in, in some ways, and in just a few ways. Uh, if I were doing this, in addition to those five, I'd probably add a couple of things. In 1679, they had the English uh, uh, Habeas Corpus Act, which, was, which sought to codify the, uh, the ancient Anglo-Saxon right of habeas corpus. So those of us who were, it wasn't the French, it, wasn't, it was the Anglo-Saxons. Uh, Thomas Jefferson was a real <laughs> Anglo-Saxon man. He studied it, and he believed that the roots of our American liberty started with the Anglo-Saxons before the French conquest uh, a thousand years ago. So is this like, this looks like a lot of the stuff that Jefferson and Madison studied. They all studied this, and Jefferson and Jefferson studied everything. <laughs> yes? What was that? The name of that again, that oh, the last one I was saying, the 1679 uh, Habeas Corpus Act. We'll talk about habeas corpus when we get to our individual liberties. It's the one that was so <coughs> important there in England, that, that uh, which is where our common law comes from, that when we wrote our Constitution, when the founders wrote the, the Constitution, they included habeas corpus in the main body of the Constitution. They didn't know they were going to have a Bill of Rights. They didn't know they were going to have a Bill of Rights. And so they included that to make sure that it was protected uh, in the Constitution. I've got to tell you one story about Thomas Jefferson because someone said about him, him studying, uh, you all probably heard the story of uh, Kennedy when he had a, a a White House dinner for all these brilliant people. I don't remember if they were scientists or politicians or whatever, but they were brilliant people. And he said this is probably possibly the greatest uh, collection of, uh, of intellectual uh, power under here at all at one time in the White House. Uh, he said since Jefferson died here alone. It was his, his, uh, <laughs> his statement. About, and it was, you know, true about Jefferson. And Jefferson was wonderful and brilliant. But Jefferson said about Madison, by the way, who was the father of the Constitution, he said, I believe he's the very best man for the job at this time. And Madison borrowed Jefferson's books. We're going to watch a movie in the fourth week about that, but he, uh, okay, so, uh, in my mind, in my mind, in addition to these historic events and, and documents, ah, we've got to go through some documents, we've got to go through, uh, real quickly, some history here, we're leading, we're getting close to the American rebellion here, but we haven't given enough excuse to rebel yet, and so from 1770, 1756 to 1763, England and France were in the Seven Years' War, and wars cost a lot of money. And England ran up a bill, and England said, we got to come up with some money to pay the bills. And we got the colonists over there. And so they turned to the colonies, and they started with this series of tax of tariffs. The first one was the uh, uh, 1764, you had the Sugar Act that uh, taxed sugar and molasses and stuff. And, the, and these were all taxation without representation. Uh, 1765 was the Stamp Act, which taxed every single paper, all uh, legal documents and, and bills of sales and deeds and advertisements and, new, new, and a deck of cards and a, a flyer on the telephone post. They probably didn't have telephone posts. But they, anything that was a written sheet of paper, you had to have this stamp with the king's picture on it uh, showing that you had paid the tax on it. They hated that during the Stamp Act. Uh, They started, uh, the, the women of liberty, what did they call themselves? Daughters of liberty, uh, started boycotting goods imported from England about this time. The Sons of Liberty, who were started by Samuel Adams. He's my man, he was the appointment. I got five minutes? Oh, that's plenty. Uh, they had the Quartering Act in 1765, where the soldiers could, said the soldiers could come and live in the colonists' house and do whatever they wanted, and take what they wanted, and so on. And, and about this time, well later, uh, and th they finally repealed this hated Stamp Act, but they passed 
along, at the same time, the Declaratory Act, which declared that, that Parliament could pass any law that it wanted and had complete control over the colonists in any way whatsoever, quote unquote. One of the, it, it was the basis for a series of new laws, one of which was the, the Townshend uh, Duties Act, which expanded this list of imported goods uh, that gave Parliament unilateral power. It's kind of a na 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 na. We have the right to do this, and you have no power to object. That's what the words were over and over in that. Well, they were upset, the colonists, and they had a tea party, Samuel Adams. They got 50 guys dressed up like Mohawk Indians, dumped what today would be millions, but a whole shipload of English tea in the, uh, in the harbor there. And so the England then, pa England then passed a bunch of laws that we call the, the Intolerable Acts. They didn't call them that. They called them the Coercive Acts. But there were all these acts to punish, especially Massachusetts, took away all of their uh, political power and took away uh, and, and put kind of, uh, taxes and so on them and on the rest of America to punish them for the, the uh, Tea Party. Uh, oh, you know, it's not Bloody Sunday. It's the Boston Massacre, where you had uh, you had uh, hundreds of people surrounding these, I don't know if it was 15 or 20 uh, soldiers, but the soldiers had guns and the people didn't and the soldiers were feeling threatened and, and, uh, and they ended up firing on the people and five of the people were killed and Samuel Adams, always the PR guy, uh, said, it's a massacre. So it's, and it was one of the, uh, the St. Valentine, not St. Valentine's Day. <laughs> that was another. Uh, okay. In, so these things led up to the people getting more and more fed up. And, but they could, they were they were loyal British citizens, and they're saying, we can't, what do we do here? They're treating us like chattel, like cattle, like we have no rights. We're British citizens, and they're taxing us without, re that was Samuel Adams' phrase, by the way, taxation, no taxation without representation. I know, we're about out of time here. So in my mind, these historic events and acts and so on, which, which with, and documents by which uh, our English, our old, former English uh, political culture changed over the centuries. That, and in addition to the Protestant Reformation and the Scientific Enlightenment, that meant we don't have to worry, we don't have to think about uh, things on the basis of unscientific deals. You know, it used to be that every king had a, uh, you know, the medicine man is the second guy in the Native American's tribe. He's got great power, but there's no difference between a medicine man and voodoo and hoodoo and magicians. The Magi, I believe they were great, I believe they were inspired men of God, but they were magicians. They had great knowledge of, they had political and psychological and physical uh, and astro, uh, astrological knowledge and so on. But all of these people were used uh, in various ways to support the king. Well, the scientific enlightenment uh, took away from that idea and said we don't have to we don't have to worry about occultic, mystical things and so on. So the scientific enlightenment, the, the Protestant Revolution, these lists of uh, somewhat of an evolution of uh, these historic acts and so on, and these just plain political tyrannies, the Stamp Act, the, the uh, and so on, pretty much forced America to do this crazy thing. Uh, which was to declare our independence and thereby effectively declaring war on the most powerful nation in the world. Uh, gosh, did I get anywhere close to, to We're out of time for today. We knew we were going to have a hard time getting through. We got, I will say this, religious, economic, political. The main reason that most of our ancestors came over here was for religious, and or economic and or political freedom. If we went to all of ours and our genealogy and so on, you'd probably find I could name ones of mine that came over for one or several of those. Equality, what's the idea? Do we believe in equality in America? Not anymore. Is everybody equally rich? No. Is everybody equally good looking? No. Is everybody equally smart? No. Well then what, why do we say we believe in equality? What kind of equality? Opportunity. Equal opportunity, equal equality before the law. That's what America is all about. It's about the rule of law, which is the U.S. Constitution. It defines the rule of law. These other things define the rule of man. Again, Skousen calls it people's law versus ruler's law. 
this benefits the, the uh, rulers as you're uh, reading through that. And the consent of the governed is required because we, the governed, we're the sovereigns. That's why that, so we're going to put this together. We're, gonna, we're done. We're going to declare. Before, before you leave, I want to cover a couple of things, and then those who would like to stay and ask time questions, you know, we're so here. Question and answer. Let yeah. me just, one last sentence. Uh, we're going to declare, we're going to lead, lead up to declare uh, uh, our, end of, and talk about the Declaration of Independence uh, next time. I think I'll leave it at that. Is that next time? The Declaration? That's next time. We'll do that. And, and I promise you, you'll come away with this understanding the Declaration of Independence and appreciating it, I hope, more than you ever have uh, before. And then we'll spend several weeks mm -hmm. on the Constitution. Can we give Tom a big round of applause? That was a lot of material to go through in a hurry. We want, really want to keep this to about an hour. If you have to leave, I wanted to have this good lady show her quilt. She brought that. That is the Constitution. The Constitution. Tim, help her hold it up. My Tim. Look at this thing. Look at that. Has that got the whole Constitution on it? as many times as you can. We know this is eight Tuesdays in a row, but we're going to do, do it again. So please come, and I know you're going to gain. If you can't come to them all, I know you're going to gain a lot and, and bring more with you. Um, what's, what's, uh, <coughs> so uh, thank you for coming. And if you'd like to ask Tom questions, raise your hand. Anybody got a question? I'll just say about this over here, the Constitution is the shortest and most successful. Kenya just did a Constitution, which by the way, uh, is a pretty good Constitution, but it's, two, it's 198 pages long. Ours was 12 pages, the way we typed something here, it was four pages the, the way they wrote it on their big uh, thing there and so on. Yeah. Anyone have any questions we want to talk about? I mean, there's so much we haven't gotten to here. Yeah, I wanted to hear once you had the liberal versus conservative parties that you had to put down. And what is the question? I didn't. Okay. What do we have to say about liberal versus conservative? I think that those terms.